So for our opening speaker, we have Adam Argyle, who, fun fact, used to be a cheer guy. Unfortunately, if you had expected him to backflip on the stage, which he can still do, he says, maybe next time. But give it up for Adam Argyle. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Definitely not embarrassing uh, being a cheer guy back in the day. Um, but it was so cool. So while I'm typing in my password, uh, my talk is called, oh, snap. Would you all snap together? Just like, that's cool. That is cool. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. That scroll control. So scroll snap points is what this whole presentation is about. And the presentation is built with scroll snap points. Watch. Shing. And we'll go over how I did that and all sorts of other stuff soon. Oh, yeah, cool, thanks. I, I was like, it's meta, but I didn't know it'd be rad. Okay, so first off, we have a background on overflow because that's what you need to do first. You have to create an overflow scenario in order to create some scroll, scroll snap points. We will start with clipping. That's the most basic overflow hidden. We have items that are like, don't squish me, right? That's why it's like a flex layout, the direction set, no wrapping. Each child is like, I don't shrink. And that's why they're pushing out of the space. Furthermore, the uh, viewport, the scroll port, is has a firm height and width set. And that's why it says, well, I'm not changing based on you. And they say, well, I'm not changing based on you. And they go, well, what happens with overflow? And in this case, we said, I oh, just clip it. It's all good. Here's horizontal scroll. So you're like, okay, well, overflow on X. And it says, great, that's fine. And if you didn't know, you can change the direction of scrollers and look at how it changes the scroller. You can do this with lots of different document modes. And so scrolling is immediately this complex, very stateful thing where it's handling the location of scroll bars. Look at this one. Okay, overflow Y, nothing too special here. But look at overflow Y and right to left, the scroll bar is on the other side. Oh, you can't see it though. That's too bad the scroll bar is on the other side. Just trust me, I guess. There's also logical scrolling. So you can overflow on block, which is in my computer here, is set to uh, vertical, and scrolling in line. This is only supported though in Firefox at the moment. So logical properties, I'm a big fan, but they're still kind of propagating to all the browsers. Then you can also scroll on both. And oh, I guess it's a little underwhelming seeing it there. But look at that. And you can scroll both in right to left. And if you could see the scroll bars, they would be on the opposite sides that you thought. And it's just really fun. So a little bit more on overflow is here's a little term glossary as I go through. So that was like our ramp up of just overflow. Um, I'm going to use some words later, and here's what they mean. So when I say root scroller, I mean the topmost scroller. Typically, this is your HTML tag. You don't have to do anything to get scrolling. It just is there. Um, and that's what they call the root scroller. The root scroller gets special things. It gets the pull to refresh on Chrome or something like that. Um, the root scroller is often the one that always has the bouncy effects. So that's uh, elastic scrolling. We'll talk about that. Uh, what that term is here soon. But scroller promotion is possible, which is where you take a net, like a just a div somewhere into the body and you make it the full screen and you put it on top of everything with Z-index and the browser goes, hey, there's a, there's a new scroller in town and it's sure big. Let's make it the root scroller. And that's how it gets promoted. And that then that scroller that you overlaid like that can get pulled to refresh and all those other little uh, features. So anyway, that's your root scroller. All the rest of them are implicit scrollers right here, and that's just any nested scroller, or really anything that's just not the root scroller, uh, which is not fun. It's no fun to say, it's not that. We're like, then what is it? Well, it's not that. Anyway, so implicit scroller, that's what it is. It's any of them that are nested. So then we have the scroll port, and you're gonna hear me saying that a lot. That's the viewport frame of a scroller. And we can see, like in my previous example, I've tried to put a purple outline on all of these scroll ports, so that you can kind of give an idea of like, what is the constraint space that things are scrolling in. Then I have scroll axis. This is a 2D coordinate system to translate along. So scrolling is always happening on one of these two axes. We have scroll behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. Scroll behavior is down here. Yes, scroll behavior is there. So scroll behavior is from CSS or JavaScript. Control if the browser should instantly go to a new destination or smoothly go there. And we'll see that there's times and cases for both, uh, whether it's reduced motion, where you want to reduce the motion and go somewhere instantly because the user's not in control of that motion, or I'm going to show you a cool trick where snapping is critical in creating an illusion. So both of these things are things we'll leverage uh, creatively, which is really fun to do in CSS. Then we have overscroll behavior, and this is should a nested scroller trap its inertia or not? So maybe you've done this on a modal. You open up a modal and you're scrolling down and it's fine, but then you start to scroll back up and you get to the top and then the background page starts to scroll. And you're like, that is totally not what I wanted. 
I just wanted to scroll the nested scroller, not the big one or whatever. Uh, you can trap it with overscroll behavior, and we'll talk about that. I typically always put it on a nested scroller. I mean, when do you really want it to leak out? I don't know. But maybe you have a cool feature where you want it to stack the scroll in a cool feature. I don't know. So then we have overscroll effect. So this is the effect of when your UI is telling you that you have reached the end. So different operating systems have different overscroll effects. We're going to mimic one today, which is the elastic banding uh, overscroll effect. And then there's scroll hints. And these are UI hints uh, that tell people um, that there is a scrollable area. So Leo Veru has a famous one where it was like a, a radial shadow on the top and the bottom that was conditional based on if there was somewhere to scroll down or somewhere to scroll up. It had local attachment. It was super cool. Anyway, that's a scroll hint. So these are things telling the user uh, there's space here to scroll. Usually we do scroll hints by like cutting content off. We're like, yeah, we cut the carousel off. Surely that means that it's scrollable to everyone. Um, but there's better ways to hint it. Okay, so that's the glossary, a little bit of overflow, and now we can talk about scroll snap, the basics, because this is, this is tends to be how most people use it, I think. So for the scroll port, we have a scroll snap type, and you can give it parameters such as X and proximity, scroll snap type on Y or mandatory. So X is telling which axis you want the scroller to be snapping along. Usually it matches your overflow setting. Proximity is saying snap if it's close to this thing. Otherwise, let the user be in control and they can kind of free scroll through there. But if they find themselves near a landmark that you have identified with, <gasps> scroll snap a line, then it will stop there. Whereas mandatory says, uh uh, this scroller at all times must find a snap point. And both are useful, especially the mandatory one. Uh, but the mandatory one can also be evil, where, you know, like the, the, you as like a user, you're like, oh, I'm just scrolling and it goes snap to some spot. And you're like, well, I just wanted to go somewhere. So there's ways to use mandatory bad, but there's a lot of really cool ways, and we're going to get into that. So then for scroll items, these are the kind of um, children inside of that scroll port. You can choose to snap them aligned to the start, the center, or the end. And let's look at some of those. And no, I'm sure very few of you know, there are Chrome dev tools for scroll snap, and they look rad, and I can't wait to show you uh, what they look like. Okay, so here is your classic scroll snap. Uh, scenario. This is probably what you've built before. You have scroll snap type X mandatory on the scroll port. And then on every child right here, we've got every child uh, scroll snap aligned to center. And so, okay, cool. I'll scroll along. Look at that. It snaps in the center. I mean, it's still pretty cool and beautiful, but let's open up DevTools. Oh, I didn't test this in uh, our little experiment earlier, but everything looks hunky dory. Let's go back here and I want to disable this view. Yeah, and then I want to enable scroll snap on here and look at the Chrome DevTools. So what Chrome DevTools are telling you here is that the purple border is your scroll port. Every blue dot is telling you this is a scroll snap destination and they're all in the center. So it's telling you I'm trying to snap in this scroll port these items into the center axis and we can watch it work. It's magic and it looks very cool. I'm going to go back and turn that off and we'll be looking at those more. But that's the dev tools. That's your basic horizontal uh, scroll snap. Here's your basic vertical. And this one I used Y proximity, just so you could see the difference. And really the difference is, uh, you're not gonna notice it here in, in these examples. Because everything is so tight together, everything is a snap point too. We've, we've targeted every child. So everywhere you scroll, it's gonna find somewhere to snap. Um, anyway, that's vertical. Vertical could be really nice for scrolly telling. Uh, Apple made it famous where you'd go to their website and you're like, cool, I'm going to scroll. And they're like, whoa, to the next little dot. And you're like, whoa, to the next dot. Anyway, you can scrolly tell with uh, scroll snap points. And it can make for good storytelling, right? It's just like a paged book. You're like, oh, the next page and stuff's popping out. But you can also snap in both. And I call it, it's a matrix. And look at that. Oh, yeah. And the dev tools for this look awesome. we got to pop them open. So I'll do a little selection here, grab this, go to the scroll snap badge, which is right next to the grid badge, pop it on and boom, boom. And we get to see all of our snap points as they go uh, and try to find a destination. And that is, that is looks, how's it look up there? Oh, that's cool. I was really excited for how that was going to work out. Um, so you got your dev tools, you got your matrix of snapping. So we're still kind of in the basics. 
Now, now let's talk about scroll snap stop. This is like telling um, all the snap points or telling a certain snap point that like you are a very important destination on this trip from New York to LA or whatever. Like you have to stop in Chicago. You have to stop here. So what you do is you target a child and you say scroll snap stop always. And that way, as I scroll, the um, browser and the scroll port are going to say, well, I have to stop on this next item. I guess I will. And so here I am flicking. I'm flicking in a way that should go pretty quick, um, but it's snapping on each child. I can, though, however, go kind of long and pass it on my own while I'm like, I'm the driver of this car. <laughs> okay, maybe that's just me being weird, but whatever. So that's scroll snap stop, and you can tell it to explicitly stop at various spots, and we'll find how that can be really useful. It could also be maybe annoying to users, so you got to be careful with how you're using these things naturally. And then here's matrix stops, just to show it's possible, so you can have it snap stop on every item in every direction. And that's just kind of cool to know it's possible. So let's move on to scroll snap advanced. This is where I start to get into the fundamental things that are going to unlock the really cool part, scroll snap tips and tricks. But let's go through the advanced. Uh, and these are going to be scenarios where I'm like, most people don't know that you can do this kind of stuff with scroll snap. For example, a uh, single snap. We've so far targeted every direct child and told them to snap just like a carousel. You don't have to do that. You can find the fifth child and snap only to it. And since we said mandatory, check this out. I can't even go anywhere else. It's just like, I, I will snap uh, only to that one item. And that might look ridiculous. Like, why would you ever want to do that? I'm going to show you how that ends up being real cool. So the idea that something, only one item is currently snappable and being in control of where that position is, we're going to leverage that later. In direct snap, we've also chosen every direct descendant every time. You don't have to. It could be any nested node in that tree it can be a snap destination. It can also be a forced scroll snap stop always scenario. And so here I'm snapping on emoji. So these emoji are trying to be in the middle. And there we go. These two are both competing to snap into the middle there. I'll flick over here, flick over here. Um, kind of cool. So I don't think it's very common knowledge that any child can be a snap destination. In fact, if we look at the dev tools uh, for this, it's kind of cool. Just to change it up a little bit, we'll go to scroll snap here. And look, there's your destinations. All right? So you can go debug it. And here's our scroll port in purple. And here's the items trying to be in the snap position. All right, you're hanging in there nice and good. Uh, trapping scroll. I've got a hungry overscroll monster class because it's going to eat all the inertia. Uh, nom, nom, nom. OK, whatever. Um, we got contained. So here it is what it's like when it's contained. Notice as I continue scrolling down, the monster is eating all the inertia. That's just fun to say, I guess. It's eating it here. But if I do that here, I, oh, that's annoying. Oh, it's not trapped. I just want to hit the end. Dang it. Uh, and so that's the difference between overscroll behavior contain, containing something, and not. And you can contain uh, both axes in one declaration. As you're doing here with the shorthand, you can target one, and you can also target the logical direction. So containment. I, again, I tend to contain anything with overflow uh, auto or overflow scroll. I think it's just a nice convenience. So then here's scroll padding, uh, a very commonly confused um, feature of CSS. It just kind of sounds weird. It also has one requirement, is that it only works on the scroll port. So I don't think many people know that. They're like, oh, I want some padding in the scroller. And why would you do that? Well, here's a good scenario. So I have a scroll uh, snap vertical here. And notice how the children are snapping to start. So instead of center, they're snapping this top edge. Over here on the right, I have scroll padding. And you can see that as I continue scrolling, um, it makes sure to stay away from the scroll port's edge. This is the padding from the snapping on the scroll port. And notice how I've matched my padding to my scroll padding. That's another common paradigm I find. It's like, well, if I'm going to pad my scroll container, I'm going to want the snaps to be in the same position. And that's how I get it done. Also, the dev tools show you cool stuff here. So let's go check it out. We want to look at the one with padding. We'll turn on scroll snap. And now you can see the green scroll snap padding. And you can also see that they're snapped to the start. So see our blue dots not in the center. Blue dots are at the start of the scroll direction. And they're there inside of the scroll port snapping to the padding. So cool. Do 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 scroll margin. The next one that's kind of like lesser known feature. This only works on your scroll items. 
So the children, if it's a snap child, if this is a snap destination, you can say per item how far away from the scroll port should it be. So again, we get a very similar effect that we had with scroll padding, which was on the scroll port, but now we're on a scroll item, and we get a similar effect where they're snapping away from the edge. Of course, there's cool dev tools for it, so you can go check it out. Let's go see. Scroll snap. Boom, and there is our scroll margin. Same margin color that you're used to in DevTools. Each item showing you how it's supposed, trying to be away from the edge. So I've used scroll margin block start in these. Even though my, you know, my snippet makes it look a lot simpler, I was using scroll margin block start. So that's why it's on the block direction at the start. I made a little bit of margin away from the scroll port edge. Very cool stuff. Scroll snap. <laughs> All right, scroll into view. So here's a feature that I don't, I mean, I think this is more known than some of the other ones here, but you can target an element and just say scroll into view. And you can say behavior smooth, which would make a transition uh, over time. You'd see an interpolation and you can tell it which direction you're scrolling. And so here I can hit scroll into view. So I just scrolled an item into view smoothly. These are really cool features. If you've got little dots at the bottom of something, if you want to make something interactive and take someone to a In fact, I have a tabs example where you can scroll the tab sections, click a tab section, and it scrolls in uh, the applicable content area. Scroll into views. You can target an element and bring it into view. Snap after layout. This one is critical. And guess what? It wasn't in Firefox, and they're hacking on it. They started last week. They started fixing this feature last week. So it's in the spec. It was like a late addition to the scroll snap spec is snap after layout. So I'm going to scroll my scroller and have it find a snap position. It's there in the center. And here is the magic juju is as I resize, the snap point is maintained. This is not how it used to work. This had to get specced. What happened before is the scroll position was maintained, not the snap child. But now as you rotate a device, for example, the same snap position remains snapped which is critical because you don't want to rotate a device in the middle of a slideshow and be popped into some other random position. You want to be on the same slide you're on. So the position or the snapped child is persisted. And this becomes a critical feature of some of our fun tips and tricks we'll do later. So when you're thinking about that and when I reference snap after layout, this is what I mean is that you can change the size of the scroll port and the snap child stays in view. Here's another advanced thing is using an intersection observer to kind of discover what's in view. And intersection observer is pretty confusing, but uh, here I'm trying to hopefully break it down in a couple of uh, good use cases. So first you need an intersection observer callback and you're gonna get a callback with all the nodes that you're watching. So in this case, we're gonna target a scroll port, which is gonna be like just any of our little scroll snap examples here. And we're gonna get back all the items we're observing. So here I'm I have a loop of just elements inside of a scroll port, say item of scroll ports, IO observe items. So I created a new intersection observer here passed on my callback, told it what scroller to be watching. And then I said, look at all these items in that scroller. And as the scroller is interacted with, I'll get this callback and I get to do, I don't know, I can filter, I can sort, I can do all sorts of things with those nodes. And so that's the essentials of intersection observer. You have to watch a scroll area and then say every item that you want to observe. And as those items come in and out of view, you'll get your callback. So we can use it like this. I've got my IO callback. I'm getting back some nodes. I'll say for each of the nodes that are coming in, uh, toggle their class called in view based on is this node intersecting. So this is a really succinct set of code that does this. If they're in view, add a class. If they're in view, add a class. I can take them out of view and in view and watch them change and get the class. A, just one function, a tiny bit of code, and I get a really cool effect. Now, when you create the intersection observer, you can pass it more options, and I'm not gonna do a talk on intersection observer, but you can give it some offsets. So notice how mine are, are triggering, it's like immediately, it's just part of them are in the viewport. That's just the concept of is intersecting. But later you can say, how much must it intersect before you call it back and pass it to me? So you have that kind of control, um, but that was just a cool basic example. I have a whole bunch of scroll snap demos and examples at this URL, snapgallery.netlify.app. Um, and feel free to go there and just, yeah, take a picture of that. There's, uh, it's kind of a private URL. I don't know, but I'm giving it to you now. Um, I've been hacking on these for a while as proof of concept for the scroll snap two, uh, CSS draft that we're working on. Kind of just like building out all the things. Also, I want to mention like one of the other things people don't know about scroll snap is it doesn't matter how wide or how small all, all your items are. Everything can be of a variable width. I don't have a demo in here today that shows that, but it's critical to know that usually we see this like same sized scroll snap scenario. Totally doesn't have to be that way.
Okay, so for review, we have the scroll port, which manages the overflow axis, scroll snap type, gaps, padding, scroll padding, and overscroll behavior. So that's the stuff you need to be concerned about on the scroll port. As a scroll item or a child, you can tell it to snap a line, snap stop, manage margin, and scroll margin. So those are your review. I think those are kind of succinct and critical things to think about is what's the role of the scroll port and what's the role of the scroll item and boom to the best part of the talk do i have a little thingy it tells it, yeah i got 25 minutes to do the cool part this is the cool part i don't know it was it's hopefully it's been fun up till now but this is where it gets crazy uh okay crazy for css <laughs> whoa okay so we got a slide starter kit here so like scroll snap point great for slides right it's i've Oh, I've been making slides with it. So here's slides. It kind of works out. Um, we've got a scroll port with scroll snap type Y mandatory. So we're requiring that this uh, must find snap destinations. And the scroll item has been given. Well, in this case, it wasn't. But you can imagine like mine is 100 VH on the size. Scroll snap align to start and snap stop always. So that's preventing people from like whipping through your presentation and be like, and going 20 slides in. They could whip as hard as they want. It just goes, Kunk. <laughs> you're like, gotcha. Uh, anyway, so that's the starter kit is sort of the essentials. You've got the scroll port with snap type and a scroll item uh, snapping and it's a uh, stop always. So here is a really cool trick. If you target the scroll items and you give them position sticky top zero, check this out. Right, they're stuck on the top. So as a new item comes in, it slides in like regular, but then it's stuck. And DOM order is making sure that the subsequent children are on top because that's the way it works. So we get a really cool uh, slide effect with two lines of code. Ah, CSS, you're so cool sometimes. You can also add 3D perspective. If you look at my slides, look at how that title, see how the title's moving at a different rate than the, the code samples? See how it has this really gentle whipping effect? It's just slightly offset. I've done that with 3D perspective. And the way that that works is here's my scroll port. I give it some perspective. You can change it whatever you want. I set the perspective origin to center center. So that way the things are trying to, as they come in and out, they're focusing on that as the um, vanishing point. Then I target my scroll port and scroll items and I give both of well, all of them transform style preserve 3D. It's massively critical. This didn't used to be critical, but there's been changes in the spec and now preserve 3D is very much required. And the last part, the really cool part where you get to change the, the cool funky feeling is you target anything that you want and you translate it zero. You push it back or forward in space and you are literally changing the depth of something and watch as I scroll through these items. So that first one had depth of zero. This one has, I call them depth zero, one and two, but really it's like five pixels and seven pixels or whatever. Um, adjust it to your own desires here. Uh, see how as they get further um, into depth, they have a more extreme um, kind of effect with the the parallax, and here's three items. Look at them just sort of like, they look like they're staggered with this like beautiful, th I didn't do that, it's just the scroll doing all the work. And then I can come down here and say, yeah, that's rad, that was cool, right? Um, but yeah, look at how they kind of, they look like they're stacked on top of each other, which would be, anyway, I'm amazed and I made it, so. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, these slides are built with this. I built this slide framework in CSS a long time ago. It's called Slide, you know, the why, because naming things is hard. And you can use it just like this. Import my styles and import the JavaScript if you like. The JavaScript has pre-written intersection observers for you. It tells you which slide is in view. It also updates the URL, so you have deep links. You can deep link to a slide because the browser looks at the hash and says, there's an ID with the hash, and it manages all the scrollers and puts them into view. It is a beautiful thing. And here's essentially what you get with slides is you get, um, I manage a horizontal scro um, snapping scroller, and then I build vertical scrollers. And each vertical scroller has its own scroll position. So here I'm in group A at slide two. I can swipe over to group B and go to slide two and go back to slide two. So if I had tried to make this a matrix, like the previous examples, you wouldn't be able to go through each of these individually. They would be all tied together as one big chunk. And in this case, I have nested uh, scroll snap points inside of scroll snap points with scroll snap points inside of scroll snap points. If I really think about it, I think sometimes we're going like five levels deep in snapping. The browser is an impressive beast. Okay, here is another, uh, this is also clutch to some of the, f well, I guess we're in the tips and tricks. So this is the start of one of these concepts, which is nothing is currently snapped on this scroller. But if I tap, I can tap to snap. See down here, I've got is active or focused scroll snap align center on interaction and in a mandatory scroll snap point, I'm saying snap that item. 
and look at as it snaps it into view. Now you can say over scroll, or you can say scroll behavior smooth, and Firefox will smoothly do them. And I logged a bug on Chromium so that Chrome also should smooth scroll between these as I tap. And it becomes a much more elegant interaction where you're tapping to bring something into view. So tap to snap. We're going to conditionally either late give something snap or very early give something snap and then take it away and watch what the browser does. So let's look at some other fun examples. Uh, Christian, you in the crowd, raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, he made this awesome demo. This was the, this is probably the trickiest of all the tricks today. And look at, we have an auto sliding scroll snap point scenario that even when it gets to the end, it goes back to the beginning. There's no JavaScript. And the way that it works is very trippy. And I'm going to try to explain it to you. <laughs> it's also Chrome only. I think other browsers should be equally as fooled, but they're not. It's, it is very tricky. Okay. So what's happening is we have like a five second animation and that's why the percentages are really long here. We essentially are taking item one translating it up and the browser's like, hey, that's changing the scroll area. You're, you're making this all taller and, and it now just went out of view. And you're like, yes, it did. I did just do that. And then as soon as it goes out of view, you go snap again. So you get rid of snap and then you bring snap back. So while you're pushing it, there's nothing to snap to. You've pushed it out of view and then you snap it and it goes, oh, this one's in view. And then you push it out with an animation and goes, oh, this one's in view. And then the one at the end gets to toggle and it has a Nice animation brings it back to the beginning. It is pretty cool. Anyway, so that's auto forward and it's a very tricky trick. Um, but I've made a vertical version here. He has a horizontal version. And since it's all CSS, if you hover, uh, I didn't build this, but his does. If you hover on it, you can just take out the animation. So then people can free scroll their way through the thing and not have to worry about getting interrupted by the animation. No JavaScript to do that work. You're just saying, oh, if this thing's being focused or hovered, why don't you just not animate anymore? and the thing becomes a regular scroll snap point area. Very cool demo. Uh, thank you for making that. And our, uh, like the document, your article was good. I was able to follow it. Okay, I was mentioning earlier how, uh, you know, usually you wanna scroll snap something smoothly into position unless someone wants reduced motion, at which point always do a, a quick snap. But in this case, I'm going to simulate an infinite scroll. So infinite scroll being a cyclical scroller that just as soon as it gets to the end, is going to come back to the beginning, something that we typically use JavaScript for. And I have done it with scroll snap points. So as soon as I got to the end, I'm back at the beginning. As soon as I get to the end, I'm back at the beginning. I'm back at the beginning. The way that I did that is with this intersection observer. It essentially says, OK, what's currently intersecting? Uh, is it the last child in this view? Then go ahead and snap that first child back into view instantly. So you, you've landed on the last slide and I go, spink, and I put you right back at the beginning. And since it's instant and since browsers are sick, it does it without a flash or anything. It's just it's like there. So here we go. We got to the end. It just magically puts you at the beginning. You have no idea. It's an illusion and it's, I don't know, it's kind of tricky and cool, right? So anyway, you can create the only requirement here is that the first item and the last item in my whole list are the same. And that allows me to do that illusion fake swap, a simulated infinite scroll. <laughs> uh, that's cool. Okay, so this is this stands for style, measure, and oh snap, style, measure, and reset translation. Yes, uh, we, as you can tell, we shoehorned this name into Smart. Uh, so this was me and another Chrome engineer trying to figure out which item is snapped. It's a mystery. You don't know. The browser doesn't tell you. It's just something is snapped and nothing in this world can actually tell you what it is, except this function. This function is really interesting. So on scroll end, so scroll has completed, I go in there and I bump the gap up to 100 VW. So it goes, and there's just massive gap between all the items. Now, remember snap after layout and how it maintained the position of the scroll snap item, even though we changed the size of things. The only item that's in view when you've given something that big of a gap is the item snapped. It makes it very easy for me to go in and say, hey, intersection observer, who's left? And the browser goes, well, this one's left. And I go, cool, give it a class. Give it a class called in view and make it a circle. And now we know which item is snapped. How tricky is that? And again, the browser is so rad that I go boom, boom, like that. And you don't even know. You don't even know. And here I am like just toggling a class after it all. And it's that smooth. Now there's some cool conditions here, which is like, if I get to the end, uh, we snap that last item, which is interesting because we're trying to snap in the center. And you'd, you'd think that this square right here is in the center. And I actually can't, oh, look, it did snap. 
Oh, good. So this res this particular like screen size, I can snap this middle item, but look at how delicate of an interaction it is. One of the things that's really interesting about knowing which item is snapped is you'll discover that not all of your items are always going to snap. You might and very likely have created a scenario where many children won't actually find themselves in that snap point. So it would make it difficult, but not impossible, to create a selection mechanism, which we'll look at. Is it the next demo? Nope. We'll get to that demo in a second then. To make a selection mechanism where like you scroll and the item that's snapped is similar to the item that you've chosen in like a select box or something. Um, so you got to be careful with what is snapped might not always be a snappable item. But there's really cool, I mean, we can use scroll padding and margins and stuff like that to help you make sure that everything can be in that snap position if you did want to use it as a selection mechanism. So anyway, that function, that snap gallery that I shared earlier has the example of um, this smart technique being used. And you can go take all the code and use it as you like. But it does require snap after layout, which means that this particular technique doesn't work in Firefox yet. Waiting for it. It's going to be awesome. Overscroll effect. Okay, so remember, uh, for me personally, one of my favorite features of iOS is that every scroller gets the bounce. It's a very satisfying gesture to like hit the edge of something and watch it bounce and then go. Chrome, on the other hand, um, only bounces the root scroller. And it bugs me so much. Uh, I have bugs logged against it. We, uh, we do, by the way, we do plan as Chrome to make every nested scroller have the bounce effect. In fact, in, in the latest Android, it's now a stretch, which would mean all of your stretching effects would come into all your nested scrollers. You could, of course, uh, get rid of it if you don't want it. But anyway, I can simulate it like this. Look at that. That looks just like the overscroll effect, doesn't it? I'll go to the other side. That's just like the snap. And look how natural. Uh, that is, right? And that's one of my favorite things about scroll snap points is they're so natural in every platform. So you're watching me scroll snap on Chrome OS, but if you got on a MacBook, if you got on a Windows machine, if you got on your Android, if you got on, all of these have native scroll feel. It's, you can't fake it. It's one of the things about JavaScript scrollers is they always have this uncanny feeling because they're not the, they're not the real scroller. This is always the real scroller with scroll snap. And since what I've done here, is I've made the, uh, I've, I've got a box in, in right here, just like imagine really quick. Actually, we could probably DevTools inspect it in a sec, but there's totally a box there. It's just invisible and it's not a snap point. Therefore, I can scroll towards it, but it is not snappable. And since I've set it to mandatory, it goes back to the one that was there. Simulated overscroll effect by having unsnappable edges. In fact, let's, let's DevTools inspect it. And we got some, we got some time here. Cause that is a fun effect. Oh, here, look, over scroller. So here's my elements. They're 20 uh, viewport units wide, and here's the other one. And basically, the selector says, hey, if you're not uh, over scroller, right? Oh, this is getting tiny, bumpy, bumpy. Yes, if you're not the over scroller, oh, well, here, down here, then you can have a scroll snap position. And there it is. So we've got scroll snap aligned to start as long as you are not uh, that item. And so here, we can pull it open here. And doesn't even show the node because it's not even a scroll snap point destination. So DevTools doesn't show it. Pretty sweet. Okay. So we'll, uh, let's see. I lost that. Yeah, it's right there. Boom. That was a simulated overscroll effect. Um, and I discovered that on accident because it's been really fun. It's been really fun, like testing out having things that do snap and don't snap and managing snap late and early. And we'll get into it. So anyway, that was a, that was a mistake. Remember the first demo I showed where it was like, it doesn't look very useful only having one item snappable in the center and I could go to the edges, but you noticed how I had that elastic vibe. And I was like, well, I want that elastic vibe. So maybe if I just give the, and that's how it all came together. So some of these things look really dorky in that advanced area, but as we move through these, um, tips and tricks, you'll see the creativity of CSS emerge. It's like our, it's my, one of my favorite things about CSS is watching what people do with these tiny things that look innocent and then they turn into something incredible. Um, okay, so here's scroll start. And I think it was supposed to start right there, but we'll fix it here in a second. Uh, scroll start is where you want a scroller on load to be somewhere other than the top or the left. This is really common on like Spotify, for example. You go to a playlist and you get to see the beautiful header and the whole list of tracks and you scroll down and it's fine. And you scroll back up and hey, there's a search bar. This happens in uh, iTunes and stuff too, where they like to tuck the search bar up above the main content area for you to scroll up to. And the critical part is on load. It's already snapped there. And usually what we have to do is do that with JavaScript. JavaScript has to say, window, unload, target, main, scroll into view instantly. It's like, it's late to the party, um, you know, and it's JavaScript dependent. Well, here is a way to do it with CSS. 
I have a two millisecond animation. Did you see it? <laughs> no, it's two milliseconds. Uh, the whole point of it, though, is we go from something that is snappable to not snappable. And we target one item. And in this case, I targeted this item and I said, here's your animation. Uh, you're going to be a snap point in a mandatory scroll snap container. And so the browser goes, I've got a scroll snap start uh, on this item. Okay, I put it into view. And then you go, ha ha, you're not snappable anymore. And the browser's like, well, I'm just going to stay here now. And you're like, yes, you are going to stay there. So you simulate scroll snap by giving it snap and then taking it away. It's the opposite of the one where we had no snap. And as soon as you tap one, you give it some snap. Uh, CSS is not that aggressive. I'm sorry. I'm like st stabbing my boxes. It's weird. Um, but what I want to show here is let's open up DevTools. Pop in here. We'll show scroll snap. We can see our animation is on node. Yeah, animation scroll start. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to scroll away. Right? It's not snap. And notice that nothing snaps. It's just a free range scroller. And I'm going to take off the animation and put it back on, which is going to give it a snap point, take it away in two milliseconds, and boop, it's in the middle. So that's how it works. You can also reinitialize it later and set a snap point back and then restore a free-flowing scroll scenario. Um, this is quite hacky, though, if it looks if you. I think that's hacky. And we'll see in the next section, which is, well, we're not quite there yet, but things coming next in scroll snap. Uh, one of them is called scroll start, the ability to do this with one line of CSS, not a whole bunch of hacky animations. Pull to refresh. Okay, so check this out. We have this little area down here. Notice if I kind of gently pull, I'm going to snap back to my content. But if I pull all the way, I pull down to an animation and I snap back. That's all with scroll snap points. And okay, so it's this is a combination of many tricks. On load, we snap to this content main area. On load. So it's the only snap point that's there. So again, a scroll start simulation. As you pull down, there is now a scroll snap point at the very top. It's a thin snap point. And this is why you had to go past that 50% mark for the browser to decide that that's a destination to go to. Once you snapped to that point, I'm watching scroll end. I look to see if the scroll top position is at zero. And then I set the loading attribute. I do a fake fetch. And then I scroll uh, main back into view. And that's the essentials of it. And then I added some scroll timeline for flare and scroll snap always. Because look, if I scroll down and I come back up, it's going to stop there. If I didn't have scroll snap stop on main, it would have continued up into the uh, lazy load or the refresh. And that's not what I want, right? So snap stop always is critical in a UX moment here. It's not annoying at all. This is saving people from finding themselves scrolling into the overscroll effect. And I'm just going to uh, redo this because it's really nice to watch it as I scroll down. Look at this. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, anyway, um, scroll timeline is very cool. That's what I used to build this. Scroll timeline is a spec under uh, a reevaluation, and this is using the old syntax. And scroll timeline is so cool. It's really nice with scroll snap points because it's almost like you have key frames and you can transition and define how to animate between those snap points, aka key frames. It's super cool. And you can use it like this. So, yeah, there's a, so here's the scroll timeline. I'm saying like syntax is changing. But if I swipe through this tab simulation, See how the underline grew to the width of the destination um, and also gave me some good feedback as I went there. And, and is also scrolling these items into view in the main section. So I can, uh, yep, I can tap one, have it scroll that item into view, like I was saying. So we have scroll snap points in the top and scroll snap points in the middle. I have a scroll timeline watching the position of this main scroller and updating animations for each of those different sections. It's pretty cool. And it looks like my scroll into view is being kind of funny, but anyway. Very nice. So that's using scroll linked animations with scroll snap points to pull off some really cool effects. This is me trying to recreate the really nice um, tab UIs that we get on mobile. I like being able to swipe between my tabs. That's really important to me as well as tapping them and creating nice linkages between like clicking this item really just scrolls that ID into view. So there's no JavaScript in a lot of those cases. It's scroll behavior smooth. I tapped. I went to an ID. Kind of cool. That's uh, using the hashtag, uh, like the target um, in CSS. Okay, so here's a date time selector. It's just a really cool design I saw online. I was like, I can do that with scroll snap points. All right, it looks really nice. And if we knew which item was snapped and we could derive it from JavaScript or something, we could then submit this information to the database and says, they want Sunday, the 10th of August at 1313. 
or whatever. And you can let users free flow and choose. This feels really nice on mobile as you're just able to kind of whip through these and make some selections. And the way that this is done is just display grid. I've got overflow Y auto. I'm uh, containing the over scroll. So right as I get to the top and the bottom, I'm not going to find myself scrolling out of them and a snap type Y of mandatory. And that's what's giving these all a snap point. And they look really nice. So just more creative tips and tricks and things that you can do with scroll snap that aren't carousels. Chat, this is a critical demo as well. So remember where we only had one item that was a snap point? Check this out. We're looking at the last snap, uh, chat bubble, the last child and telling it to snap a line to end. And that lets me do something like this. Hi, CSS day. This is a cool demo. Question mark. Uh, why are you asking me a question? Uh, aren't you presenting right now? What's important is it stayed snapped at the bottom. As the height and everything changed, it knows that the last child is the snap destination. Therefore, a no JavaScript CSS only solution to get a scroll, like a chat UI to stay snapped to the bottom. This was one of the main reasons that they did uh, snap after layout and stuff was that so that you could adjust items inside of there and maintain a position to the uh, desired snap child. Kind of cool. You can build a whole chat UI with scroll snap points. You can also build stories. So if you've been in stories, you tap on the right. Here we tap on the right. We move on to our next friend. Oh, hi, cool raspberries. You know, oh, your feet look great in that field or whatever. Uh, cool. Move on. And so, okay. So the way that this one works is I have a regular carousel-y type scenario, and then I use CSS Grid to place everything on top of each other. So it's like, hey, you've got how many pictures? I don't care. You're all going to be in this one cell in Grid, and that creates a stack. And then with JavaScript, I'm watching for taps on the right and the left-hand side, depending on which side they tap on. I scroll the next item into view. It's really, it's like a, I don't know, 10 lines of JavaScript and a clever uh, CSS grid and uh, scroll snap point scenario. And you get stories that you can swipe between your friends and continue moving through their items. So really cool, creative tips and tricks for snap points, I hope. And the final one here is I really like gesture UIs. So one of the things with building gesture UIs in JavaScript is that you, um, they, they can feel uncanny and not right. And so if you scroll snap points, you get a very natural scrolling scenario. Hi, Fly, get out of here, fool. Um, and look at that, I can snap over here. And if I wanted to, I could pull all the way and like snap it to that position and then actually call delete and do some animations or something like that. But I just wanted to show that having scroll start be in the middle is again, really important. Okay, so what's coming up next in scroll snap? You can check out my explainers here. They're at uh, GitHub, Argon link, scroll snap explainers. And I'll just go over them with you here quick. And we also have scroll snap two is in draft. So it's been in draft for about a month. And um, I'm gonna show you some of the items that we're adding to scroll snap so that you can complete more of your tasks and write less JavaScript to do some of these mysterious effects. One of them is snapped. Wouldn't it just be nice to know which item is snapped? Okay, look, this item is snapped. Thank you very much, CSS. That was so helpful for the browser to expose the item that snapped to me. You can also ask it which item is snapped on X because if you have a bi-directional matrix, there could be two different items snapped. So it's one of the tricky parts of this spec is that there's all these different considerations, one of which being uh, dual directionality in scrolling. So be excited for the snap to pseudo class so that anytime something snaps into view, you can give it a box shadow, raise it up, do it all from CSS. Scroll start. So again, we, no more keyframe hacks. We can just target a specific element like the salmon block and say your scroll start target in line is auto. So this auto flag tells uh, this scroll start target and the browser that that item wants to be in the like the starting position on load. And so no more JavaScript, we can do this all from CSS. It also allows you to offset scroll by a length. So if you knew the height of your nav bar, for example, you could say scroll start is 50 pixels. And so it'd start 50 pixels down from the top. And there you have your uh, scroll start position. So using links or a targeted element and the spec outlines how all of that resolves. Here's another thing that's really important are some new JavaScript events. One of them is on snap changing. So if we watch this little demo from Pokemon Go, you um, notice that as it's panning and it, as it just hits over that 50% mark, it changes the UI, even though the user hasn't released, right? So we need an event that says snap is changing, followed by snap has changed. Snap has changed here. Watch as I'm, I'm getting snap changing events as they highlight the two things on Twitter. But when I let go, 
That's when the tab itself knows that it's time to go lazy load its content. We need to have snap changing events so that we know immediately as the browser is considering new destinations and we need an event that says when it's done, when a snap point has rested, the user is done interacting. And these two things will help us build a lot of really interesting UIs with a lot less JavaScript. Another one here is making it real easy because I'm sure you're building carousels with scroll snap is to make it easy for those left and right arrows to just snap previous and snap next. It's like the most used function in any library that you grab is just snap to the next one, snap to the previous one, and the browser doesn't have that concept. We're trying to teach it that concept. So you say scroll port, snap to whatever's next or whatever's previous and do it smooth. So we're adding new parameters to the scroll to function. And that is it for that. And holy snap, that was a lot of scroll stuff. Thanks for hanging in there. Whew. If you want the slides, they're right there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam, for an amazing opening. One more round of applause for Mr. Argyle. So this was fun because questions started coming in while you were talking, and then you answered some of them. So, <laughs> I mean, nice. that's great. That's great because like, you predicted what the audience wanted. But there are still some questions that were unanswered. So Paul is asking us, asking you, what do these amazing scroll settings do for users who navigate via keyboard? I actually had this question as well. Excellent. Yes, uh, there are great affordances. So my all of my slides, can you can use the arrow keys because the browser will manage up and down to go through a vertical scroller and left and right to go left and right through the scrollers. So if you use scroll snap points, it's similar to a mouse wheel, which has a stepped effect, there's a lot of extra code written in Chrome to handle a stepped scroller, right? Where you you, as a user, like to jump to new scroll positions, the jump will be turned into the equivalent of an arrow press on your keyboard and take you to the next item that is a snap destination. So just like how you can use your arrow key to go down the page, uh, uh, like you probably do sometimes, uh, you can use those arrow keys to navigate inside of scroll snap points. I'm gonna extend that question a little because there's mandatory and proximity. And I peeked at the spec a while ago. Proximity is very ambiguous. So how would proximity play together with keyboard controls like because if it's mandatory it's one tap one one snap to the next yep so in a proximity scenario so as you arrow down or arrow left and right you're going to get the same nudges that you're used to mm -hmm. on the scroller and if it finds itself within the proximity of a snap destination it will find itself and snap it to it cool very cool excellent question though so this is not really scroll snap related but it's scroll proximity it's about scroll bars so nice florian asks scroll bars vary from system to system is there a good way to make them look similar or hide them without losing functionality so like as i said not directly related uh that's a good question so my slides if you uh you can't really see it i have styled the scroll bar um, i do it on a very rare occasion in this case i'm in control some slides um, and they're only on the slide containers. It was weird that Chrome OS didn't show the scroll bars on each of my nested scrollers. Usually one of my favorite things about Chrome OS is when it um, finds a scroller, it will show the scroll bar and then fade it out. So until you interact with it again, at which point it fades back in. So again, it's a scroll hint saying that there is, this is a scrollable area, here's your thumb. Um, my general advice is don't customize the scroll bar. Um, I think it's, an accessibility issue. People really expect to be able to click and drag that with familiarity. And as soon as you change it, it becomes uncanny and awkward and you could really mess someone up. So uh, this is probably the only case like with my, like my slides where I wanted to hide it. In fact, I don't hide it. I make it really thin and it shows you your position along the timeline. But yeah, good question. You can hide it. There is a spec. Uh, Firefox obeys the spec. Chromium doesn't yet. I have a bug out so that Chromium can match the spec uh, so that you can target scroll bars with, I think it's just like scroll bar, thumb, scroll bar. Anyway, you style it with just a couple CSS properties instead of those weird pseudo selectors. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we have one about accessibility. So how do we consider reduced motion accessibility for scroll snap stuff? Yep. Uh, so when you're snapping between destinations, the one of the, at least my experience with folks who have reduced motion issues is that, or just need motion, it's like, if they're in control of scroll, it's no big deal, right? They'll scroll a web page all day, that's not the issue. It's when they click a button and the page goes whoosh in front of them that they're like, well, I didn't do that and now I feel like I'm on a boat and it's awkward. And so um, 
the way to do it is to snap instantly there. And you can use that scroll behavior behind the at media uh, prefers reduced motion query. And so inside of there, you say if they do prefer reduced motion, in fact, I like to do it the opposite. If they have prefers reduced motion, no preference, then you can set HTML or your scroll port, set that scroll behavior to smooth. So assume snapping instantly and upgrade to smooth if this user has no indicated preference about it. Um, so that's how I like to handle it. I also handle it in JavaScript. So when you're scrolling something into view through the programmatic JavaScript API, you can ask to the media query, you can match media, say match the prefers preference, pass that preference into the um, parameter called smooth or not, and that's how you can handle it from JavaScript and CSS. All right, we're going to wrap it up now. Thank you once again, Adam. Yeah.